Yusuf Nurkic has suffered another particularly unlucky injury after breaking his right wrist against the Indiana Pacers. Welcome back everybody, I'm Dr. Brian Suter and this is your number one source for learning about medicine, sports, and all the cool science in between. Now, this is a really strange injury because it's not particularly high impact, it's not a classic mechanism for a wrist injury, and for Nurkic, it's the second one of these kind of weird, fluky types of things he's happened with a fracture, of course, having that really gruesome leg injury previously. If you enjoy learning about this side of the sports world, then please consider subscribing and hit that thumbs up button if you enjoy this video. Here is the play where Nurkic got hurt. We can see Malcolm Brogdon driving into the lane here, and Nurkic reaches out with his right arm to basically swipe down trying to hit the ball. And really from this view, it was hard to understand how in the world this was enough of an impact to break his wrist. It doesn't look like he made particularly hard contact with Brogdon. His arm is in the same sort of alignment plane with Brogdon, so it's not coming down severely across it. And so just from this view, it was really odd trying to figure out what exactly had happened. Even when Nurkic fell to the floor here, you can see he basically guards to protect that right wrist. He lands on his left wrist over here and basically rolls off of that right side. So it really wasn't even the fall where things got worse. It was clearly before the fall where he injured the wrist. But we have another view and thankfully from the side here, we can finally understand why this injury happened. So as Nurkic is swiping down, he completely misses the ball, completely misses Brogdon's arm, and his wrist makes contact with Brogdon's kneecap or patella here, very hard bony surface on the front of the knee and that's when the wrist gets broken. If we really try to zoom in here a little bit, you can even see sort of the portion of his wrist that makes contact with Brogdon's knee. It's really the thumb, it's what we call the radial side of the wrist because it's on the radius side or the thumb side. And so it really wasn't even an axial load with him falling on the wrist, it was simply contact directly onto the side of Nurkic's wrist, which is still, to be honest, pretty strange. Now there is a little bit of some deviation here as we come down it's hard to really see where Nurkic's thumb is. We can of course see his middle finger, we can see his index finger, and it's hard to tell where his thumb is getting bent up in all this, which could have something to do with it. But even still, not too terrible of a high low type of stress injury. By far and away the most common mechanism where a basketball player in particular is going to fracture their wrist is when they fall. We call it a foosh injury, a fall on an outstretched hand, foosh. That's because when you fall, you typically flex your wrist up like this to brace your impact, and then you get all this axial load from the ground that drives directly into that wrist and causes the fracture. But that's not at all what we're seeing here. So this is a definitely unique injury. Now all we know is that it's a wrist injury, and if we look at our anatomy, that really can kind of cover a wider area than we would hope for to just explain things. First off, we've got our anatomy from the forearm bones. This is our radius right here highlighted, and then this is the ulna. A distal radius fracture is actually probably one of the most common wrist breaks that we'll see, because technically this whole part of the wrist joint could be considered the wrist. The distal part of the radius is this guy up here, and so it's pretty common to see a fracture of this kind of part of the radius, especially again when someone has a foosh injury. Remember I said the impact was to the radial side of his wrist, and so that's gonna be this portion over here because it's on the side of the radius. That's where your thumb sits. Now technically if we're talking about wrist bones, we're gonna be talking about the carpal bones, which are these guys that sit here deep inside the wrist. The one that you've probably heard about in here is the scaphoid bone because it's one that we really have to be closely monitoring when it's a fracture because of the specific blood flow and healing pattern, and that's gonna be this guy right here. We'll talk about why an injury to the scaphoid is of particular concern, but we then of course have the rest of our carpal bones here through the wrist. I've got the cartilage shown here, just so you can get a sense of kind of how much articular cartilage these bones are covered with. And then as we get out to the thumb, this is gonna be the row of metacarpal bones, more in the palm of your hand. So if there was a fracture of one of these metacarpal bones, you would assume they'd call it a hand fracture. When we get over here to the thumb, that's where it can be a little bit messy because I could see somebody describing a fracture to the base of the thumb metacarpal as theoretically a wrist fracture. So while I wanna say that a wrist fracture means one of these carpal bones, which would be kind of a different management picture, I could certainly see him having a base of the first metacarpal fracture right here at the base of the thumb, and then still kind of theoretically reporting it as a wrist fracture. The exact management of all these injuries is so varied depending on which specific bone it is, where the fracture is, and then the degree of break in terms of if there's a lot of angulation, if the fracture involves the joint space involving the cartilage, that's gonna be a more severe injury. And so there is such a wide possible range here of how long Nurkic could miss depending on which specific bone is fractured and the fracture pattern. Even just the question of if he needs surgery or not depends on if we're talking about a tiny little crack in the bone 
versus a big comminuted displaced interarticular fracture. Now for his sake, just going forward, I think it's probably better if it's the thumb or the base of the thumb than one of these wrist bones in the carpus, mainly because these bones have a lot more articulations when he's shooting. There's gonna be a lot more movement through that joint than there is gonna be through the thumb. And so just thinking of scar tissue, possible healing complications, I would probably prefer to have a thumb fracture here at the base of the thumb than a wrist fracture if I'm a basketball player. Now, none of these are in any way a career ending type of thing unless you have some surgical complication. So this ultimately pales in comparison to the leg fracture that he previously had. Now I wanna to touch briefly on this scaphoid bone because it's a really important one to understand if we find out that this is in fact the fracture. Again, the mechanism here though of him basically just striking, making contact with Brogdon's patella doesn't really make me think of a scaphoid fracture. Typically a scaphoid fracture is gonna have some sort of load through the wrist, not just a contact or a blow to the side of the wrist. I mean, your bones are pretty superficial here and easy to palpate, and so you can even push. And as I'm kind of pushing right here on the top of my thumb, I'm actually technically pushing on that thumb metacarpal. I'm not really pushing on the carpal bones of the wrist. It also doesn't really look like the direct contact that Brogdon makes is on the radius or the forearm, it really does look like it's kind of centered much more here around the thumb. But let's get back to the scaphoid here. The big problem here is with healing of a scaphoid fracture because of the unique blood flow pattern, something that you're at risk for called avascular necrosis. It's what Bo Jackson had in his hip. The blood flow of the scaphoid is unique in that the blood vessels come up and then actually wrap around to give more of what we call a retrograde flow pattern. Blood vessels aren't penetrating up here through the cartilage. They have to enter in through this non-articular part of the bone. And so the blood is coming up and then moving from distal to proximal. That means if you have a fracture that cuts through this part of the scaphoid, you don't have that blood supply that gets down to this piece of the bone. It's coming up, it's wrapping around and then coming back down. So if you have a fracture of the scaphoid, you've gotta follow it closely because you worry more about healing potential. So we'll see if we get an update here with Nurkic's injury. Again, I really wonder more about kind of a thumb base fracture as opposed to a true carpal bone fracture just based on the mechanism. We really could be talking anywhere here from just weeks or so to potentially months, depending on ultimately the surgery that he has to undergo, if any. And again, just where this is, because as you can see, this is complicated. This is why there are specific surgical specialists that just do hand surgery, because this is a complex field. This is a complex area of anatomy, and there's a lot of variety in the types of things that we can see injured. That's it for the video. I hope this was educational to learn a little bit about our hand and wrist anatomy. Let me know any questions or comments down below, because one thing I'm gonna start doing is try to sort of take some time at the end of each video to touch on some questions from previous videos to follow up with what you guys wanna know about the injury, depending on if we've got new news. So let me know down below. I'll look at some of those questions and try to get them in our next video. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.